Hello and welcome to Barnabas Junction. This video is a little bit of a special video. It's uh, one I've been wanting to do for quite some time, but the opportunity came up courtesy of the North Staffordshire Community Rail Project and these guys, Avanti West Coast. Yes, I got the opportunity to go on a very special one-off one station tour of Crew Railway Station to aid the 185th anniversary of Crew Railway Station. So, coming up is some short, a few photographs of some very unique places around the station and live footage recorded of the tour that took place, various places around, in and outside the station. Uh, so, I introduce you now to Nicky. He was the tour guide for the event and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. But please excuse, we were in a working environment. Lots of noise, lots of uh, trains, lots of traffic as well. So uh, please bear with the audio. It is worth listening to. So I'll hand you over to Nicky now at Crew Railway Station. So Crew Station opened in the 4th of July 1837 uh, and that's how it looked when it first opened. Uh, that's the same map, that's it. Yeah. So very different from how it is today. Mm. Well, we'll be able to see these pictures online at all. Yeah, the, I mean the pictures are from our, uh, from our online. So you, if you want to have a look at them as you go back and you see the ones that you want to have a look at, they are all online. So you can you can go and view it at your leisure as well. So, so just, as we say, opened 4th of July 1837. And that's how it looks at the time. Now, crew stands on the ancient, ancient parish of Barthelme. And it became a civil parish in later life and then was named Crew Green to avoid confusion with the adjacent crew. The station was given the name of Crew, which, which stands in the parish of Coppenhall. So in 1867, uh, the station was totally rebuilt due to expansion and, and growing trends in rail travel. Uh, in the period between 1903 and 1907, platforms were lengthened to accommodate longer trains once again, due to demand for rail travel. Uh, once people realised they could get about faster than walking about, they were like, oh yes, we can do this. Let, let's see what this railway thing's about. So um, this is what happened back in the 1900s. The main buildings on platform five and six, which we'll see uh, a little bit later, um, were built 1867 when they realised that the station needed to be bigger than what it was in, its, in the current um, photograph. Now Crew Station stands, um, whatever you've noticed when you're studying waiting for trains, you've got lines south, west, east, west, etc. So at the north, going that way, you've got Glasgow going up towards Preston, Lancashire, going off that way to our uh, north to the west. Uh, we've got Manchester lines to Wilmslow. So we've got a good partnership with the uh, Cheshire Rail Partnerships for the Manchester to Crew line. Um, going off in that direction, off towards Stoke on Trent. And then going right down the main line towards Birmingham and London. And then off to the right, as we look at it, off towards Shrewsbury and South Wales. So where we are here, we're really in the centre, and this is why crew was a major terminus for everyone to change at, and the, the famous phrase is change of crew, because that's what you pretty much did on the journey back in the day. Now the Crew Arms Hotel, just, just across here, um, that is very much as it was built, uh, built back in 1837, and it was the first railway linked station hotel. Uh, a lot of the ones you see these days, you've got Manchester Central, where the GMEX is, um, you've got uh, Wilderness of Pancras, 
Coventry to mind York. And various stations like that had the London Marlebone as well, had its own link station. But this was the very first one, and it's still here today, and as it says on the top. Now, from what I gathered, the 1880, that must have been when it was furthered sometime. I don't know, I don't know any of that one. Definitely those in the station was first so it's um, it's always stood there and um, yeah, it's always been a hotel. So that's that's the cool. It's uh, very grumpy, obviously very, very happy station because we're not pretty So so how so how crew was formed as a station? So crew stands on the Grand Junction Railway, which ran between 1837 and 1846 which then became the London North Western Railway. And this linked Birmingham, Wolverhampton, Stafford and Crewe, which was the main Midlands link into this part of the area. Um, and this was the main bulk of the West Coast Main Line as, as we know it today. The Liverpool Manchester Railway opened on the September the 15th, 1830. And this was later linked into the Grand Junction Railway to link into to Crewe. The London and Birmingham Railway operated 1833 to 1846 and that later became part of the London and North Western Railway operation. The first long distance railway ran from Curzon Street, Birmingham to Dalham, Warrington which later joined into the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Those of you who know will recognise Curzon Street as the Midlands station for HS2. So at the moment um, I, I was down there recently went to the Science Museum in Birmingham um, as you come past Snow Hill Station, or no, sorry, Birmingham Moor Street, to come past the Moor Street Station, it's a massive big work site uh, where the Curzon Street, the old great, the great two listed building is there, there it's, it's under scaffolding at the moment. But the whole site is a massive, massive site, and that will be the new terminus for HS2. So uh, there's still a lot of links there to the old, the old railway, and I think when they've been building, they found various relics and things that they've uncovered as they're doing so they've had to be careful with um, conservation and all that sort of thing going on down there but yeah so Curzon Street has a history going back right to the first days of the railway so as, as we mentioned the crew, the crew uh, was the first station to have its own railway hotel with crew arms which is just, just behind us and it still remains today so Crew itself, just um, I'm sort of flitting between years and different things, going back to modern day. But crew in normal times, um, out of the pandemic, handles approximately 3.3 million people a year. Uh, and a lot of the people sort of come here and change here for other connections. So yeah, it is a very busy station. We, I mean, I, I, I worked through the pandemic and on some of our busy trains we were literally one passenger at a time uh, going down to London. It was, it was very, a very, very strange period to work through, um, but it kept you, kept you busy, kept you, you know, coming out to work on a daily basis and obviously we were careful with it all, but um, yeah, very strange to go from a really, really busy station to a practically deserted station, yeah, mm. yeah. So the station is served by uh, cross country, Avanti West Coast, East Midlands, Northern, London North Western, Transport for Wales, and the Caledonian Sleeper. Caledonian Sleeper comes through here uh, 10 to midnight going north uh, and comes in at 5 o'clock in the morning going south. Um, and that train's pretty busy. Uh, a lot of people use it for um, leisure purposes, for hiking in Scotland, people travelling between Scotland and London, vice versa, for business. Um, travel over that on the sleeper, so that, that travels every night both ways. Um, so cruise station as well is, is also quite famous for charter traffic. Uh, a lot of the charter trains we have here, uh, locomotive services, which we'll, we'll see in a bit. Uh, over the other side, they've got a vast array of uh, both modern and historic uh, railway carriages, steam engines. Uh, and also at Intercity as well, where Midland Pullman was a, was a thing they introduced a couple of years ago uh, to the heyday of going back to the Midland Pullman train. So hopefully if it's out on the yard when we go down the platform, if it's out then you'll probably see it. Uh, also Northern Bell comes through here, uh, which is West Coast Railways, and we also get every year for the Grand National we get the British Pullman. Uh, I mean, it's actually, it actually came through 
couple of months ago doing some work which I didn't know we were doing, but it only ever comes through once a year. That's going up to up to Runcorn for the for Hayden, for, um, I'm trying to think of the Grand National entry. Um, so yeah, that goes up to entry, and then it comes back through back in the evening, and, you, and it stops in the platform, and you see all the people with the champagne, and <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so it's such a such a privilege to see that when it comes through. It's such a lovely when it comes through. So yes, yeah, so we got our fair share during the summer, and also out of summer as well. Uh, a lot of full lot of uh, charter traffic. The um, main ones are Carlisle, when they go over the Settle Carlisle Railway with the steam engine. Uh, it's all the Pullman dining. Um, so yes, yeah, it's all the pleasure to see those and uh, dispatch the, the old steam trains. So, so that's a little bit. So what we're going to do now, uh, I want to sort of link in as well with um, freight operations. So freight here at Crew, there's a, there's a big Obviously, being on the West Coast main line, also towards Manchester, there's a lot of big freight depots around now. Uh, those of you that are, are obviously from the local area, Bassford Hall. Uh, you see where the big, uh, big lights and the big stanchions are. Well, that, that's the depot here. But a bit further down the line uh, is Bassford Hall, Marshalling, and Freight Yard. Um, massive big yard where they, they take a lot of the freight trains into, switch over engines shunt about and do various moves and then they carry on north so Bassworth Hall is a big, the big freight yard that you see as you pass down towards London um, so we have freight through here that's uh, operated by Freightliner, DB Schenker, uh, Direct Rail Services and Colas Rail Freight so we, we get all the freight operators through here now when crew was built the freight used to come through the station that it was at the time and then there was a big demand for Freight to be moved because as the railways became a lot busier, this crew was getting sort of literally too busy to take the freight traffic through. So what they did was they built, when they did the change in 1867, they built the, what they called the independent freight lines. Now the independent freight lines, if ever or if you've ever seen them or, or known about them, so behind the hotel here, going out on the Manchester line independent freight lines underneath the station so what they do they come from Bassford Hall they could be dropped down and see and you'll see them beside the station in between the station and the uh, football ground you'll see some freight lines now what we'll do is a bit of a we'll walk that way and you'll see where they are so they go underneath the station some of them carry on northbound they carry on to the West Coast Main Line and some of them veer off to the right in the, the Manchester Line. So all the freight traffic goes underneath the station. And they were designed back in uh, back in the 1860s um, and they're still in operation today. They have, a, they have a nickname? Um, Not that I'm aware The of. Mucky Hole. Okay. That's the known nickname of crew. Right. The mucky hole. <laughs> I know a few, uh, was it, I think it was last year, they had quite a lot of rain uh, and they actually got flooded out. Um, so they had to send it all via the, uh, via the station. And at that point, you realise how much freight goes through there. Yeah, an awful lot of freight. So, with the freight side of things, um, there's a daily train that goes um, from Daventry to Moss End, and, that, and that's called the Tesco train. Uh, other, other brands are available, uh, we have to say these days. But the Tesco train uh, is operated every day, runs both ways, uh, and that runs between the two major terminals. And that goes through, that, that's just one of the ones that we see going through most days. Um, it doesn't go underneath though, does it? No, it comes into the, that's one of the only ones you see that comes into the station yeah, where they actually do a driver change. change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of them come in in the morning, the early morning ones yeah. to do a crew change, but generally they go right away underneath. So never knowingly underground. <laughs> this is it. This is it. Yeah. So, so with with all the freight side going back in history, um, you will probably know. Some people probably won't know that the Royal Mail trains used to run at this station, sort of seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the evening. Suddenly became a massive Royal Mail hub. So where we are standing now, what we'll do? We'll have a walk a bit further along. I'll explain a bit more to you. Okay. Okay, so where we're standing now, this used to be Western Road, Royal Mail, Sorting Office. So a lot of the traffic coming by rail, or coming by road, shall we say, 
came into here from the local sorting offices, came into crew, and then they would sort it here, massive big sorting office, and then they would get all the mail uh, into the various mail bags, and they'd have all the, the trolleys, and they would use the subway here, which was only a raw mail subway, and all the mail would go onto the station, and then they would meet in all the, the TPOs, all the travelling post office trains. They would travel through the night, and they would start Glasgow, London, Edinburgh, uh, Manchester, uh, right across the country. And what they would do on those trains is they would literally sort the mail that was put on the trains. Uh, if ever you've seen any pictures, I have got some pictures. Um, completely sorted out here. So very much the, the Royal Mail trains sorting through the night were the backbone of the Royal Mail operation. Um, to give you some sort of idea there, that shows the Royal Mail teams on board. So they'd have all the pigeonholes and they individually every night would arrange the pigeonholes to their own personal sorting method. So it wouldn't work, one method wouldn't work for everyone. Yeah, so literally went to before when, they, when the train was in the platform, they would go through the sorting trains, they put on all the destinations. When they started moving, they got all the mail on board, they would then sort it by hand. When they got a big enough bundle, they would then put it and tie it up, put it into the mail bags, ready to leave at the, at the departing station for the local uh, sorting offices. So, so for instance, if, if it left here, so all the mail from this area, so it would be like Warrington, uh, Warrington, Wigan, Preston, that's Stafford, that sort of area stuff, the train would come to here, be sorted here into mail bags, would go onto the train, they would then sort all on board the mail that's going to London, the home counties, metropolitan London, they would sort it all on the trains, it would all be ready when it gets into London, Houston, come off the trains, all in the bags, all labelled up, onto the various TPO, uh, so from the TPOs onto the various mail bands. The mail bands would go out to the various London sorting offices, and those of you um, that are into your uh, railway stuff will probably have heard of the Royal Mail Underground train. It used to run um, Mount Pleasant was the main place. So all the mail would go right across London, the un underground system, the same as London Underground, but a lot smaller. And that system would run between East and West London. So the mail would go on the little trains. Now they would all be sort of completely controlled by, um, so there's no drivers on board. They would literally just, just uh, load up the trains press a little button and the train would leave and go and fly across the, the centre of London because London obviously back in those days as well was massively busy um, trying to get stuff across London like, like it is today as you all know is a massive nightmare to get across London. So the mail system went across on the ground and it must have took about 20 minutes to get across between east and west. Um, a great system and then for those of you that are interested it is now open to the public. My dad at the time worked for the Royal Mail and we were going down to family in the south and um, I, was at, I was at the age where I knew where we were going and this time we were driving down and you know, I said to dad, I said, dad, I said you, you've, you've missed the turning and then oh, oh okay no problem I, I can sort that out so um, next thing I knew we were in London and we parked up at Mount Pleasant and I was able to go, he managed to get a tour of it working as it was as a fully mechanised railway system um, and then just recently I've been down and seen it now as a tourist attraction and it's, it's, it's very interesting to go and see, it's based at Mount Pleasant at the, the, the Post Office Museum and you can actually go down and see the trains, ride on the trains and see how it used to work and the amount of mail that used to go through that system was unbelievable. Um, so yeah, so here at Crew we used to get all the mail trains at night Platforms you couldn't see, literally the trolleys. Um, they were full of mail bags going onto the trains. When the train pulled in, they cleared a load of bags off, put a load of bags on, and then the mail would come into crew here, sort it, and go out to the various local offices. And you can guarantee if you posted an envelope on the train that night, you would get it the next morning. Actually, I did, I did that myself once. I posted an envelope back to myself, did it when, when, when I was a lot younger, um, put it on the train at Warrington got the postmark for the special up TPO 
next uh, postmark, put it on the train at Warrington. Next morning, came through the letterbox. <laughs> Unlike today. <laughs> Unlike today, yes, yes. So, <laughs> so that 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 was a that was a scene at Crew. Of just what the, the luggage trolleys used to look like, uh, full of mailbags, an engine just passing by. Um, that gives an idea what. So the platforms were all like that during the evening. Um, you couldn't see any of the platforms, just just for luggage bags and, and mail, mail, mail bags. And that shows back in the 1970s, 80s, um, a train being loaded at crew um, for the raw mail. Just to show, uh, so the, the, the doors were all sliding doors, we used to load it on board the train. And um, used to go through the night, and any of you that know your railway history have heard of a, a poem called Stuck by uh, Night Mail, stuck by WH Orden, I think it was. Um, and it was a, a, a poem that was done for the Night Mail. Google <coughs> to find that and read it. And actually, if you go into the, the sorting office here at Crew, there's actually on the board, there's, um, as you go in on the wall, there's a, there's a frame and it's actually night mail and it is actually the poem mm. as it was done for the for the poem itself. So, what we're going to do now, we're going to walk the way that the raw mail uh, took all the luggage, all the parcels and bags down to the platforms. Would there have been any special requirements for registered? Mail. Registered mail that that would go yeah that would be literally sorted that that would go into priority bags. But it wouldn't be in a separate um, no no it would go, go on the same train and it would go in priority bags and all that would be sorted and that would come off first off the trains and then go to various offices and be delivered by there. That's got special delivery was guaranteed by midday next day wasn't it? So yeah that that would all go as priority. I'm thinking of you know things like jewellery, gold, this type of thing. Yeah, and this this is where this is this is that's linking in nicely to, to the great train robbery. Um, because that, that's a famous uh, a famous thing that happened at the time. Um, but yeah, that's, it, uh, that, that's one of the things I'm, I'm not sure of. But um, certainly for all that sort of thing, I mean the doors they, they literally sort of closed all the doors. They were they were bolted shut. Um, Everything was kept on board until the train put into platform, and then they went straight. The, the vans, not so much here, but certainly at the bigger stations where there was vehicle access, the vans would go straight onto the platforms, and they would literally meet the train in. So when the doors opened, when the van was there, they'd load them straight in. Um, yeah. And would so they have had armed guards and that type of thing? In if they place? knew that there was stuff travelling of, of sort of value, um, that would have been done by the Royal Mail themselves. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I, I, I would have thought so. Um, but again, looking at the great train robbery, I mean, that, that was the biggest one ever. I think it was two, two and a half million. Uh, let me have a look at this one now. So, yeah, so moving on to the, um, the great train robbery, which was a massive, massive thing that uh, opened up everyone, uh, everyone's eyes to what went on on that one. I'm sure you've seen the films that have been put out. <laughs> I mean, was there a British Transport Police in those days? The, the, yes, I think, I think there, I'm, I'm sure there was. There was a railway police of sorts. So the first known um, mail moving between places was back in 1830, and that was with mail coaches. So that was the uh, the horses with the mail uh, carriages, and that used to link between Liverpool and Manchester. So they used to go on a on a, a horse, the four horses and a carriage. They used to pull into the various um, pubs or establishments to have to change over horses. A lot when you see pubs these days. There's a Lumian Arch mm. which goes through to a courtyard. That was the places where they changed the horses over for the mail coaches. So in 1838, the innovation of sorting mail on moving trains was born and so became the TPO or Travelling Post Office. The concept was mail was brought to stations, loaded onto the train, sorted overnight, and would go to its destination next morning. 
1845, the Midland Railway extended trains from Derby to Newcastle, uh, upon tying the to Scotland. 1855, the Great Western Railway ran from London to Bristol. Until 1885, the TPO coaches were put on normal trains. So what you would find in those days, the normal passenger train would have parcel vans and mail trains linked to them. That stopped later on in life, and so in 1885 as well, they saw the first dedicated mail trains on the network. Uh, 1914, there was 126 dedicated postal carriages at various points across the network. Netted grabbing systems were put line side to collect and put mail on the trains without the need for trains to stop at every station. So I'll explain that. Uh, again, those of you know, those of you do know the process. Um, will understand where I'm coming from. So what they used to have is various points along the line they used to have nets that were put up at the side of the railway um, and so what your local office would do was they'd take all the mail bags they would hang them at the side of the railway on two swiveling arms. When the train was due they swiveled the arms out to track side. When the train came along they uh, on board was like a, a sprung net and it literally, literally used to spring that net out so when the train went flying past it would take the two bags literally rip them off the, the two um, clasps they would be loaded straight into the train and then anything that was on the train to come off at the same point they would unload it as well so they would, they would swing out the same process off the train into um, grabs at the side of the train. So they literally would stop the process of stopping at every station. So you can imagine the train going sort of 85 mile an hour, literally going straight past this, these two mail bags and the force on board the train of the bags actually being catapulted into the train. I mean, a few people, I would imagine a few people got uh, injured by not, not realizing and standing in the way as the two mail, you know, three or four mail bags came towards you. But that's how they used to do it. And if you go to the Postal Museum, if you go to various preserved railways as well, you will see demonstrations of that process being put in place. They the Great Central down um, Loughborough Way. I think they do. They've, they've got a fully preserved mail train and they actually um, do that, that process. Mm. Uh, the Postal Museum's got a demonstration of it. Uh, I think York might have. But various places have got these nets and, and, how, it, and how it used to work. But Is um, still have it? No. No, unfortunately, um, when when the process became quite dangerous, health and safety got involved. They just they, they, they sort of stopped it. It wasn't a safe uh, method of work. Um, when was that? Sorry, when, when did they stop? Um, on that one, I'm not sure. Unfortunately, um, it must have been must have about the 50s, 60s, I imagine, because it wasn't on when the Great Trim Wobby was on. So it must have been before that. Um, so 1963 was the key year of the Great Train Robbery. With an estimated value of £2.6 million pounds worth of mail was cleverly stolen from a London to Glasgow mail train. How they did it was what they did was so the train was uh, on its way from London and it was a place called Bridgigo uh, Railway Bridge, which is in Buckinghamshire. What they did, the, the robbers themselves, they instigated the signals so the signalers would never know that the signals had been messed with. So when the signal pulled off for a green signal to proceed, they put a, a, a red reflector in front of the signal so that the train signal would be showing red. So when the drivers, who were both crew drivers, um, they were Jack Mills and Dave Whitby, they, when they came to the signal, red signal eh? right, right. so they came to a stop right on the bridge at that point they were there waiting at both sides and they just basically just bound on the train got the two drivers got everything they needed uncoupled it and then and then they had a, a, a farmhouse nearby and like the and all the barn buildings and they just literally just stored everything there hid all the vehicles and just kept low for period of time because no one no one knew who they were where they were what they, what they did anything like that so they just literally just 
they laid low and then they totaled their winnings. But of course, as, as, as you all know from the films and, and, and the adaptations of what's been done, um, I think some of them are still still about. I think recently, I think I, I, don't, I don't know what the actual outcome of it was, but it was it was one of the biggest. Um, worth of, of mail that was ever pinched from a, from a mail train. So yeah, so but, uh, I'll take you over to platform 12, you can see the plaque where they've got a plaque dedicated to the two drivers. Um, so what we'll do, we'll have a walk through now and we'll walk the routes as the way the mail used to go. Did they still okay. put money on the train? Did they still put money? No. Oh, no. No. <laughs> 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 Not now, no. I mean, oh. the, the, the sort of mail trains that run now, um, there's no sort of anymore. The ones you see these days, which you just go from uh, the PRDC, which is the Princess Royal Distribution Centre at London. Uh, they go to Warrington to the rail terminal, and then they go up to Glasgow. And that's as far as they go. All the mail is sorted on board. It just goes into the Yorkie containers. And if she goes on the train, goes up to where they're going to take them off, reload, up to the next place. And that's as far as you see these days. Why did it move from through? Why did it, it move? Such a good there was, you know, it, it was all to do with, fan, with, with money. Yeah. Um, the Royal Mail themselves were seeing that um, there was a lot of delays going on with the railways. Uh, they they knew that they could do it better by road. Um, unfortunately, that's when the railways lost the business. It was 2004, I think it was, um, when the last rail trains ran. Travelling travelling post office operation was scrapped, and they became a thing of the past. Um, I mean, you know, great operation, um, but it's, it's all on road these days. And of course, the depot here closed, all moved to Burtonwood at Warrington to a massive big distribution centre there. Manchester had a big place as well, and it all went on the on the, on the roads. There is still a little bit on rail, but not as much as it used to be. The post left at Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye
So we're going to make our way through here now. Um, so we'll get you all through. so nothing could come the other way. It's only wide enough for a vehicle to go one at a time. station in the 1960s, um, so 1923 LMWR became LMS which was London Midland Scottish Railway, 1948 London Midland Scottish became British Railways in London Midland Region, uh, and the north and south signal boxes were built in 1938, now Crew North Box still exists, or actually Crew South Box still exists, it's in quite a bad state now. So the only remnants left of what was what's left of the, the old wall metal buttons are here. So when the swing was ready to go down, you press the button and the green light will light up and walk away to go. That's all it's left. So, so how Crew Station came about, so we, we mentioned uh, about the box. There's a building just to the left of it by the bushes. That is the old True South signal box. It's um, a bit dilapidated now, but it's still there. Uh, I've got a picture of it in its heyday. Stand it for you. And there we are. That's what True South box used to look like before it closed in 1985. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So the, the crew north box, as I said before, is at the Heritage Centre. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll make our way down the north in a little bit and I'll explain some stuff for that for you. So, so yeah, when it was all modernised, uh, 1955, um, the modernisation plant, the West Coast Main Line was electrified between 59 and 74. So stage one was the crew to Manchester Line completed 12th of September 1960. I was minus, minus, seven, minus 16 then. <coughs> um, stage two, the crew to Liverpool line was completed on the 1st of January 1962. The next location then to London and the first train ran the 12th of November 1965 with the first official passenger train on the 18th of April 1966. The Birmingham line was electrified the 6th of March 1967. And then from Weaver Junction, which is just north of here, um, to Glasgow, it was all electrified the 6th of May 1974. Before it was all electrified, it was only electrified to here, the crew. So the electric trains used to run from London to Crewe, and they would invariably either go into platform 11 or 12, 
and they would then change from an electric locomotive to a diesel locomotive. So, the, so engine changes would take place here practically every day. Uh, then they would go diesel engines, sometimes a single or double locomotives, up to, up to Glasgow. Um, now the 1985 modernis modernisation plan was a £14.3 million scheme to improve track layout and signalling around Crew Station. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of, when we get down to the bottom, I'll show you some pictures of what it used to look like. Um, it was all to make lines, uh, make through lines and make higher speeds and to remove many sets of points and loops which were no longer required in the station. The modernisation plan was 1985 and it had a radical effect on services and improvements to crew. The new signalling centre, which if any of you know the area down here, again I'll try and show you when we get down to the bottom. Left hand side, just on the car park on the left hand side is the red, uh, it looks like a large warehouse. And um, that actually is the crew signalling centre. And that's where that's the way with the boxes, which ends, uh, and that's where I've been there for the thousand people and then quite an interesting place. Um, so that, that was the new modernisation plan of 1985. Um, so what we'll do, we'll go from here now, we'll go down to the bottom now. And we'll turn this about and we'll come over to where the escalated down there, right? We'll make our way down to the And then this is where you see the trains, that's the heritage centre. That is open to the public at weekends. Um, they have got a website, there is information in your bags as to what's there. So where the heritage centre we you see the, the signal box, that was Crew North Box. Now before that was built, all over there where you see where the church is, if it, I've got a picture I'll show you in a minute. So where the church is, all that area there where Tesco's is was Crew Locomotive Works. If you look across to where all the greenery is over there, there's the sheds over there as well. Now a lot of these lines, you can see going straight from the, the centre, that was a maze of lines going across, zigzagging and all sorts of things. Now I've got a picture that shows you that. Uh, and when you see it, you'll think, how on earth did they ever manage to, to signal that? <laughs> well, that's yeah. how it was back yeah. in the day. That was that was 1840 yeah. uh, with the locomotive works and the sheds on the right hand side. Now, this thing here. Now that exists and it's behind the signal box. Okay, so that part of it still, still remains and is in the heritage centre. Um, so this bit was known as the spider bridge and it linked from what was the locomotive works to the station and it had a narrow gauge railway on it. And that was built to link into the station for spares coming from the works to get them into the station, load up any uh, goods trains and get parts across the country mm. that the depot were needed to send out to people. Um, wasn't very successful near the end um, and then they did away with it. So I have a little bit of information about that one. So we're moving on to the um, so crew locomotive works was basically um, opened in 1840 and at the highlight of the works it employs 20,000 people. Um, now it was, it was um, absorbed into the Grand Junction Railway uh, and that's when the works was, was born. So born back in 1840. And that's when Crewe as a railway town was, was also born. A lot of people were mentioned to Crewe, to people from all other parts of the country, they say, oh yeah, Crewe works, massive railway place. So Crewe built locomotives um, from designs as such people as Sir William A. Stanier. Um, and they obviously worked, literally they could, they could build a locomotive here from the drawings, from scratch, and turn out locomotives in, in the workshop. And any of you that have been to the, the open days yeah. before they built the housing estate over there, and Morrison's and all that over there now, uh, a massive, massive shop where they could lift all the cranes going right away the full length, pick up bodies, take them right away across, lift them off the frames, do the wheels, um, literally could take a piece of metal and turn it into a locomotive over in the works. And they could roll the steel as well. Yes, <laughs> they could literally do everything over there, yeah, they had all the, all the patent shops, all the design shops, um, so they built this great engines as the LMS princesses, the coronations, the duchesses, jubilees, 
standard tanks used for shunting and freight work. So crew works didn't only make trains, they also made for the war effort 150 cavern cav and answer tanks for the army that fought in World War II. So they were also made there as well. Um, so Sorry, what, just what linking to called? the war. Sorry, what were they called? They were called cavern and answer tanks. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And 150 were made here. So linking in with that as well, um, I, I just, just found a fact this morning that um, a lot of people sort of think the big crew get bombed during the, the Second World War. The only part that did was on the Bentley Rolls Royce factory. Um, and those of you that sort of know or don't know, um, the Rolls Royce factory built the engines for the Hurricanes, Spitfires and Lancasters. And the workshop where they were built was workshop 16. And apparently that got bombed uh, because the enemy knew where the workshop was. And they also bombed an electrical uh, substation as well. But that was the only part that got bombed because um, they knew where that was. But the station itself, I, as far as I'm aware, I, I beg to differ, but as far as I'm aware, um, if anyone else was doing anything different, there wasn't anything at the station at all that got, that got hit. <coughs> Um, so crew in its time built 7,331 7, steam locomotives and the last steam engine was built in December 1958. It was a class 9F freight engine number 92250. As steam was phased out of crew works it became a diesel factory building class 24 diesels which were completed in 1959. The final builds of crew were the class 56 heavy freight locomotives. Then the high speed era came in with high speed trains, the class 43 high speed train diesel trains were built at crew and number 8000 is actually preserved over in the heritage centre. Um, that was the 8000th uh, diesel to be built at crew works. The west coast electrification in the 1960s brought more work to crew locomotive works as the class 87s which were the, the mainstay of the west coast main line before the, the Pendolinos came in. Class 90s and the East Coast Class 91 project was also designed and built at Crew Works. 91031 being the last electric locomotive to be built at Crew Works. Um, so they were built between 1988 and 1991. As of 2021, the plant is now a quarter of its size and run by Alstom. The other parts of the site are now houses, drive through eating places, and a Morrison supermarket. Wheel sets and bogies are now being refurbished at Ulster McCrew and HS2 wheel sets will be assembled at Crew Works for the new HS2 trains. Now the Spider Bridge, so the Spider Bridge now a gauge railway linked to the locomotive works to the station uh, by a narrow gauge railway. It was constructed 1857 and the actual Spider Bridge to the station was constructed 1878. Due to expansion and the parts uh, getting bigger it was decided in 1939 to demolish the bridge and the signal box was then incorporated into the bridge of the part that's left. So how it used to be, there used to be a signal box that was facing this way, and there used to be a, a way through, actually, there's an arch in the box, you can, again, you can find pictures online, um, over the actual walkway, and going right away through the centre of the box. That then was demolished completely. They built that as a, as a wartime design. Uh, it looks very much like a... Bunker, a bunker, that's correct, yeah, mm. that's it. That's, that's what I was trying to think of. Um, and that's how it was right until the modernisation, when that box and the south box became out of action, and the red building over there with the white line became the new signal in the centre. Uh, so everything here is controlled. I've, I've been in the relay room there, and literally go in the relay room, and all you can hear is... And it's all the signals, points, levers, controls, everything moving in, in one go, and it's unbelievable. Mm. It's, uh, Unfortunately, it's not open to the public, which is a shame because, you know, for to people to see how a station works, it's good to see behind the scenes. But luckily, thank goodness, we've got the energy centre and in there is, is, a, is a good representation of how it all works. Um, over on platform 12, um, there was the crew station A box. Now, there was a, an A box and a B box, and they controlled a lot of movements within the station. Now, the crew station A box is another thing that's preserved here as well, which is over in the Ocean Centre. And there's also the Exeter West box that came from the Great Western, and that's also over there as well. And that they do live demonstrations in there where they, they work to a complete railway plan. And you can see people moving the levers, doing the bells, and doing everything as though the trains were moving in real life. Um, so, if ever you get the chance, those of you that have been, those who've not been, well worth a visit over there. Uh, let's have a look at that. 
Uh, I have got some pictures of the cruise station A box when it was. Uh, so just to run you through some pictures as well, um, that was a station back in 1958. Now that shows the cruise station A box. Um, a busy summer, busy yeah. summer Saturday at crew. Yeah. Right. Um, just to show what it was like, it was uh, pretty busy in them days, as much as it is today. Um, mm. Even though the government tells it isn't, but <laughs> um, but it certainly is. Um, now that show, that's pretty much the scene. We're about here. Um, so there's the North Box, Box yeah. and that's a busy Landudno to Derby summer Saturday special, uh, 19th of July 1958. So it shows the extent of the, the junction here and how they could come across the station. Unbelievable back in the day. Uh, to what it is now, it's, it's, it's changed an awful lot. This picture here shows 1962, when we were sort of part way into a new, a new diesel era. So we've got... Um, a 45643 here on our Liverpool to Birmingham service and we've got a diesel on a Glasgow to Houston service um, notice that the wires are also up as well mm. for the location mm. so yeah times were changing at that point for crew and then we've got um, we've got the mail trains we've seen the mail trains and all that, that was on board locomotive works now that sure that's a, an interesting shot it shows a coronation being built in 1939 uh, streamlined engine shows in the works there and they were being built and they were literally lined up like that across the full length of the works buildings so they were being in various parts of the construction then we went into the diesel era diesel's being built as we were so we changed then from that to the prototype, now that actually isn't a crew, that's at Derby, but that was the prototype HSC or the high speed train. Um, that's how it looked in the first place. Class 41. That's it, that's right. And uh, then it, after various modifications with the, with the cab area, it then turned into looking like that. And that shows the HSC or the high speed train, one of Britain's most successful high speed trains, uh, diesel trains in, in the country. Um, and some are still running today, over 40 years. No, I built all of them. You built all of them? <laughs> Not on my own. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was in the works when we were building them. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. 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 So you'll, you'll know a lot about it. Yeah. 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 And then of course that came in. Now that, so here in Crewe we're quite, quite lucky to have in the Heritage Centre the only remaining APT set in the world. Um, advanced passenger train. Yeah, built as a, as, as a tilting train, very much like these. That's where the technology uh, of those came from. That's right. So all the, everything you see in those now came from this. Uh, this is a shot at Euston, one of the very few that was in service. And I managed to find a shot of one in crew as well, passing through crew heading south. And where were they built? The, uh, they were built Derby. They were built in Derby. Yeah, yeah. But the significance to here in the fact that we have the only set remain over there, and there's also a power car over there as well. When the heritage centre was set up, this set was um, passed to us and was preserved here. Yeah. And they've done a lot of work over there to repaint it, make it look real good. You can go on board it, it tilts a little bit now. Yeah. Uh, the, the lights work. It's, it's, um, mm. yeah. and it's one of the only places as well where you can see a model APT running and the real thing in, in, in real life. How many so, did they build? Say again. How many did they build? I think, looking into it, there's only about six or seven that were built. Mm. Mm. If even that, because when it when it sort of, I think the famous one was it had a, had a run where it went over and it, and it literally failed so many times. Uh, and of course it was a run, like a, like a press run, mm. and they literally just slated it and that's when it just, they just pulled the finance from it and it became redundant. It did do a few passenger runs, um, 
but um, after that it was just sidelined and mothballed and scrapped. And only one set, <laughs> set unfortunately, yeah, was over there. He was big in Derby, wasn't he? Just Derby, yes. Derby, not here. No, Derby. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Is this when people start to feel sick? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, this is that's, yeah. So, this story that that was due to too much of that. Yeah, yeah. was it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Un unfortunately, yeah. it was it was um, gone. So it's a shame. But again, it's over there. It's open to the public. You can see yeah, it over yeah. there. That's um, weekend. That weekend, yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 If you get to speak to Brian, he's Brian the chap Water, that, yes. yeah, he's right. the chap that uh, painted it painstakingly and restored it, looked after it. Over there. Got lots to tell you. Okay. Um, so cruise station A box, which is the box over the other side, on platform 13, which is now out of use. Um, it used to live on the platform there, and it went before the modernisation of 1985. So I've got a few pictures of it being demolished, or being taken apart, so there you can see it. And that's how Platform 13 needs to look, um, mm, being taken apart. And then they moved it, piece by piece, over to the Heritage Centre, and they rebuilt it. And that's how it looks today, Cruise Station A-Box. So then we've got a few pictures of, um, so you, you saw the Cruise South box yeah. and the Crew North box which is still yeah. over there now, still to this day working, not controlling the station of course but it is still working. Um, and then so 1985 was, was the main modernisation of the station and that's what they did. So here was the works, this is the main line where we are now. This is the site where the APT is and uh, the Ocean Centre. They literally used that as a construction site to base, and then the station closed down. Again, not completely precise on this, but it shut down for a good period of time while they did the complete modernisation, ripped out all the old signalling, everything, ripped out the track. Um, took a good while to do. Um, About six weeks, wasn't it? <laughs> Unbelievable at the time. Um, and then of course that was born, which is what we see over there today, which is the, the Crew Heritage Centre. And that was opened officially by the Queen in 1987. Um, right. She visited it and uh, opened it up. And it's been there ever since. I think it's 35 years this year. I think they put on the website. Yeah, yeah. it's been there a long time. Um, that shows various colour pictures of various traction coming through the station at the time. Um, going up to about the most modern at the time then, that was back in the 90s. 2000s. Um, of course, steam. Steam is a big, mm. big thing here, as I mentioned before. Over on the far side, we've got LSL, Locomotive Services, and they do a fantastic job at preserving the, the steam railways and the steam rail tours. And that was the one they did for the World Charter, which they did down to Windsor uh, yes, earlier on this year. Oh, Britannia? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. Mm. She, she came she, to Ulster earlier uh, this year. Yes. Got, got yeah. a video of it. Yeah, so that was that. Mm. Um, so and then the present day scene no with the Pendolinos and the Desiros, which are London North Western trains. And um, yeah, just an overview of the station and how and that, that was actually back in the Royal Mail days. So you can see the Royal Mail, the Royal Mail yeah. before the car park was there. So that just gives you a various view. So, what we'll do that's, that, that's a little bit at the end of the tour. So, I'll take you across to platform number 12 um, and then we'll end up back at the. Um, Is that where the Nike? Yeah. That's where the yeah the, yeah the um uh, the what? plaque to the Great Trim will be yes yeah. yeah so I'll take you across there okay and I'll take you around to thirteen as well so you can I'll take you through the gate there and again how many people did the works twenty thousand people mm. this is platform twelve uh, I'm going to take you through the gate here we're going to platform thirteen which was at the time platform Alright, yeah, right, so, we'll, so we'll take you through. Now this is a bit of the um, part, the non-public non bit, okay? Yeah. It's like the only public, non public bit of the tour. Really. <laughs> we'll keep it secret. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. 
there's the old unused bridge. <laughs> we were up there grabbing the tent because it took the tent pictures. And then it would have been, because you've got the gantries, you've got part of the region as well. So this was all covered very much like it was in there. Um, but this, this is all just offices now, and that's sort of normally out of bounds. And there is a couple, there are a couple of raw metal carts around as well. One over there is in. They are open to try and get them from this. One right behind you. So, as I mentioned before, locomotive services, you've got a leaflet in your bag about them. They do all the, a lot of the charter tours from here. So, they use, so they've got a couple of um, modern, I say modern, but I mean, they're probably about 40 years old now, 40, 50 years old. Um, the electric locomotives there. The blue one just in the distance, that's the blue Pullman. And that's where they're based on their locomotive services. So, quite, quite an operation for uh, the charter market down here. So that's a bit, so this, this was a working platform. And there we go, platform one. Yeah. And there we go. What a fabulous tour that was indeed. Many, many thanks to the North Staffordshire Community Rail Project and, of course, Avanti West Coast for allowing this tour to take place. It was intriguing for myself, even though I've been to the station so many times, as in just avid train watcher or even passenger over my many years. It was great to get some access to some behind the scenes not available to the public area. So a huge thank you to the North Staffordshire Community Rail Project, Avanti West Coast and everybody else that was involved in that tour. It was great to also meet some friendly faces, including Ben Wyatt of the Friends of Cruise Station. Uh, thank you. It was great to meet him and other people, including Sarah. Uh, we will be looking at speaking with those again in the future. Uh, so look out for maybe some more future videos regarding tours of railway history in crew on this channel. But I uh, hope you enjoyed that. I know it was quite a long one, but it was definitely well worth it. The 185th anniversary of Crew Railway Station. Thank you very much indeed 
for allowing me to take part in this unique tour. So that is it for this video here at Barnabas Junction. Remember to like, share, comment and subscribe. And if you would like to also, there is an option to join the channel in the main screen of the uh, YouTube channel. Various perks available for you. So until the next video, thank you very much for joining me. I'll see you again in the next one. Until then, ta-da!